Hi, everyone. This is Margarita Kiwis, um, host of, of Saw for X. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Solitaire Townsend. Solitaire has been a passionate change maker for over 30 years. As co-founder of Futera, she advises governments, charities, and brands, including Google, IKEA, and the United Nations, on imagining a better future and making it happen. With Futera offices in London, Stockholm, New York, and Mexico City, she admits that making the world a better place is a damn good business plan. You can watch her TEDx talks online and read her in The Guardian, Huffington Post, Forbes, and more often as at Green Solitaire on Twitter. Solitaire was named Ethical Entrepreneur of the Year in 2008 and more recently was chair of the UK Green Energy Scheme, a member of the United Nations Sustainable Lifestyles Task Force and a London leader for sustainability. Her new book, The Happy Hero, How to Change Your Life by Changing the World is out now. Welcome, Solitaire. Oh. Okay, so... Thank you for a wonderful introduction. For almost, Thank you so much. I've been waiting for almost a year to talk to you. I saw your Forbes piece on um, why you need to redefine your ESG goals um, around justice. And it just blew me away. My interns, my colleagues, um, you know, within Peace Innovation, we've been trying to make the, articulate the connection between ESG and peace for a couple of years now. Tell me what compelled you to put this together. You've been working in this space for decades. What can you teach us from your experience? And, and especially because peace in environment, peace and sustainability aren't mutually exclusive. How do you put that together? Well, first of all, Margaret, thank you so much for the chance to talk about it. It's lovely to be here and to be able to talk to people. Um, I actually feel a little bit embarrassed it took me so long to write that article, because this has been something which has been part of my heart, part of my drive and my passion for change, actually for 30 years. So I became a campaigner in my teens when I was about 13, um, and I was drawn into this world um, because I lived in uh, social housing in a quite deprived area when I was a teenager, and a nuclear waste company um, uh, announced plans to create a nuclear waste storage facility, otherwise known as a nuclear dump, in my local area, um, primarily because it was a rundown area and there wasn't a thought that there would be much, should we say, community pushback from it. So that lack of fairness was actually my introduction to the whole world of sustainability as a team. The fact that those social deprivation issues and environmental destruction came hand in hand so much was, was my, my very early experience. Then, of course, I did a master's degree in sustainability. I've worked in it for years. And these things are, you know, separate reports, separate documents, separate UN agencies. And I sort of followed along with that that you know, we have environmental issues and environmental governance, climate change management, et cetera, over here. And we have social issues, poverty, justice um, uh, 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 issues over here. Over the last few years, that language has, you know, and of course, with the concept of sustainable development itself, has been coming together. Um, and so many people from uh, uh, NGOs to, to uh, governments to um, individuals have been trying to push it together to make it very clear that peace, climate change, environment, society are all the same thing. It's all the same fight with the sustainable development goals. Um, actually, that became very clear. We have sustainable development goals for environment and for society, but they're all in there, although they're not crossing over. There isn't an environmental justice or an intersectional sustainability um, SDG. And finally, this year for me, um, when all of my clients, I mean, and these are some of the biggest businesses in the world, um, were putting together their 2030 targets, you know, 2020, 2021, this is when everyone comes up with their 2030 targets. This is the decisive decade, the big decade for climate change. I just couldn't bear it anymore. It's, you know, whilst watching and participating in the Black Lives Matter conversation, which was happening around the world, whilst working with people from the most affected people in areas on climate change, 
around the world whilst working on the net zero commitments which are coming up um it just it's all one thing in my head so I tried to write it down and the yeah. the that's that's you know 30 years of pressure 30 years of following the protocol of treating these things differently finally in this year came to a head and I just couldn't bear it anymore they are the same thing yes I am heartened that it took you 30 years <laughs> certainly um what I've been told often in academia it's because I'm like a you know I'm affiliated with academia but I'm not a PhD but what I'm told is that why does it things take so long in academia is because you have to sit with the problem for a long time as you have sat with this problem and you have to sit with the challenges you start going down a path of this hypothesis and you go like oh, no, that wasn't quite right back up uh, okay it's almost like you're trying to to map the train with a flashlight yeah and and it, it happens incrementally but gradually you can see the picture of the terrain and then you begin you can begin to label it and then you say oh that's what it is because you've mapped it but when you're starting out you don't have a map so it's hard to articulate where you are right and so oh, exactly. it sounds like you've done this for 30 years you've been mapping this terrain and understanding all the different aspects of the system and you came yeah. in through one door and now you go like okay i've been around long enough that i can actually see the big picture them together and because Futera serves so many clients you know we work as you said with everyone from Google to um, Earth Justice from um, Formula One to WWF um, I would I, I have very um, should we say uh, uh, portfolio days so I have an hour where I'll be talking to a client about gender justice and about trying to end street harassment um, of women. And then the next hour, I'll be talking about climate change and I'll be talking about the impact of climate change on the most affected um, people in areas. And then I will have an hour talking about young people and engaging young people in social change, an hour about recycling, an hour um, uh, about um, BIPOC artists in the environment movement. So in some ways, at the end of my day, I have had a day which overall has been very integrated, where social and environmental issues, where peace, where justice, where biodiversity and climate change have all factored. They've just factored in separate little meetings. <laughs> so I already was living in many ways a very integrated, um, full scope um, professional life working on these issues. It just that the meeting about women's street harassment and the meeting about climate change weren't the same meeting and increasingly they are and not not entirely and not all the time and it's not always possible but increasingly these issues are being discussed together and I think the terminology matters the words matter so what I've had a lot of people speak back to me about that article is ESJ environmental social mm -hmm. justice and how particularly that word justice is a word that I heard in all those meetings. I heard justice around climate change, around biodiversity, around environmental issues, and I heard justice around peace, around social issues, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and particularly around human rights. And so that's a, that's a word that is very familiar in the mouths of all people who are trying to make change. And so for me, that's the word that brings all of this together and sort of gives us our jumping off place to being able to talk about this incredibly complex you know, uh, uh, compound of issues which we're trying to solve at once. Absolutely. I want your job. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like that. Um, there is a power in providing the service that you do because um, what I see in, in, in my work is that there, there are so many silos. When I work with corporates, when I work with academics, when I work with schools, everyone is so siloed in their domain. And certainly in, uh, in academia, we talk about how, we, how can we promote interdisciplinary research? When I would work with corporations, they're going like, how do we bring innovation in? But we don't want to bring any new people in and blah, blah, blah. And so very, um, we're not only racially segregated or uh, class segregated, we're also domain segregated. Yeah. And 
And so you have this interesting position in the ecosystem where you are the inner, you're the nexus, you're the intersection point. Like you are the intersectionality. Well, well that's quite a responsibility. To to all the sectors. <laughs> you get to talk to all the sectors, right? And they talk yeah. to you and then you are the link in that social network yeah. to connect. Because, you know, one hour you talk to this side, the other time you talk to that side. And then the next day you can say, look, and, and then you can bring those insights that they can't get where they sit in the system. And it, it's, it's a privilege, it's a responsibility. And sometimes it's quite confusing as well, because of course there's also, also confidentiality within that and respect for the fact that business people think like business people, campaigners think like campaigners, um, policymakers think like policymakers and academics think like academics. And if I try to turn an academic into a business or a business person into a campaign, it's not going to work. So um, uh, I hesitate to use this word because it's taking a term, particularly from black indigenous people of color, um, but I'm going to use it because it's the word that's on the top of my tongue, which is about code switching and the need to code switch between those, um, those different languages. Um, and in fact, actually, perhaps, and in fact, just occurring to me on this, on this call, perhaps the fact that code switching is not always a healthy or productive way for black and indigenous people of color to operate and, and is, is expected and perhaps shouldn't be expected, perhaps code switching um, and sustainability shouldn't either. Uh, there's, I've got some great advisors um, who are really helping me open my eyes to the role that as a white woman I have as a pivot in so many of these conversations. I'm gonna ask them to talk to me more about that. I think it, I think it would be hard to be a white person today <laughs> because <laughs> there, there, positions of influence and power and so on. And so there's this responsibility. I'm a Hispanic woman. So in, in the United States, Hispanics are a minority. Um, and so I'll be the only Hispanic female, the only female in the room. That's sort of normal in my career in tech and Silicon Valley and so on. Yeah. And so I feel the responsibility of representation. Um, yeah. But it's it's now, a huge responsibility. In, in today's also. world, the there's there's still the the, the power dynamic and then all of a sudden you're being put into uncharted territories and there's no good template or role model to follow actually for anyone. No. And um, I think that especially the social media culture can be extraordinarily hard for all of us who are in brand new terrain and we're going to get it wrong. Well, I, we have, you know, we have people some, who are going to yeah. deliberately get it wrong because they're just like awful, but people yeah. who are really intentioned, who are really trying, we're still going to get it wrong because we don't know what right looks like. Exactly. But there's a responsibility yeah. to get it wrong, if that makes sense. Um, uh, you, I have a lot of privilege. I have the privilege of race. I have the privilege of class in this country. I have the privilege of education. I have the privilege of access and 20, 30 years of doing so. Um, I'm extremely aware of the fact that particularly on the environmental side of what we do, um, environmental sustainability is nowhere near as diverse in terms of those who are able to have a full-time paid job. You know, there's huge numbers of people around the world who are campaigners and who are individuals and who are moms and dads who are, who are passionate change makers on this but don't have a salary working on it but in terms of salad salaried roles in sustainability there is a very serious diversity problem and that is a problem morally and it is a problem in terms of the impact able to be made that i'm sorry but a bunch of white people are not going to save the world it, in order to be able to bring the perspectives required, to think innovatively, to bring experiences and lived experiences that aren't currently part of this movement. It's something which I'm doing more work on. I wish I'd done more work on, but you start where you start. And so that's that's what I'm pushing on now. And what I'm what I am incredibly aware of is that I'm saying the wrong thing, but I'm gonna keep saying it because it needs to be said. Yeah. Yeah, until we figure out what the right thing is, how to how to articulate it. Exactly, um, and, and every see, day someone explains. Generationally, me. yeah. Generationally, oh. It's, oh my god, it's like wait a minute, 
I'm like, I'm an OG Chicano, Latina. And it's like, what? And I got to part my hair in the middle now? <laughs> what? I know. I know. I know. What to... No, you got to be Latinx. And we're going like, what? Oh. Yeah. Well, try having the accent that represents um, centuries of colonialism around the world. Um, and that it's, it's a, you know, I'm very, very privileged to get to work with people in almost every continent, I think possibly maybe occasionally doesn't work with Anatovska. Um, and the, 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 the joy of that, the joy of difference, the joy of cultural perspective, um, the joy of comparing, contrasting learning is fantastic. Um, I'm also very aware of the fact that none of this is context free. It's always the context, and particularly, again, as a white British woman, there's the context of colonialism and what we talk about. And these kind of words, being able to talk about the context of colonialism in a climate conversation is necessary. You know, the science, the science is the science. It's like, it's like mathematics. Um, it exists. Parts of and carbon dioxide doesn't, doesn't care, doesn't know. <laughs> It is simply parts of the carbon dioxide. How we approach it, how we respond to that reality is context filled, absolutely context filled. Um, and we can't unpick that. And I think, again, one of the ways in which we're going to be able to come to a justice agenda, to an ESJ, environmental social justice agenda, um, is by having these conversations acknowledging these realities, bringing it into the room um, rather than pretending that it's not the case. Um, and maybe that's quite a lot to carry because you're having to carry context, you're having to learn new language, you're having to think before you speak whilst trying to fight this challenging, huge, absolutely on its own timescale problems. Um, but uh, it's not as if ignoring the context has worked for us so far. So maybe actually bringing the context into the room is what's going to accelerate sustainable change. Maybe talking about colonialism, talking about race, talking about gender, disability, LGBT+, plus, talking about poverty when we have these conversations and exclusion. Maybe actually those are the conversations which are going to move us faster than just talking about the science has managed to do up until now. Absolutely. The Langdon winner wrote a paper called Do Artics, artifacts have politics. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Oh, no. I don't know if you should Google it. It's great. And he wrote it. Let me see. On the Google machine. Um, and I remember reading that. Do politics have artifacts? And I was sending that to people around. I mean, of course, I discovered it like, you know, decades after it was written. Um, and he... And it was like in the late 70s, early 80s. And he was talking about how everything that's built has something political built in it. And like, we're not even aware. So yeah. he was talking about how uh, Robert Moses, who was like this grand city planner in New York, and he was um, responsible for the destruction of a lot of ethnic communities in New York. And said like, okay, we gotta get rid of them and we're gonna create these parkways and this master planner, right? and how he built these overpasses where they were too low for public buses to pass under. Oh. Right? And so you know how you drive around and you see a parkway and then there's this overpass that says, you know, you must be, you know, this is what the height and you have to be able to clear that. And you don't think about it much except like, I might see them and I go, well, that's kind of odd. It must have been built in the days before the trucks were really high or something. Yeah. And it turned out that that was a political decision to keep low-income people out of higher-income communities because they rode the buses. And if the buses couldn't get through, that was a structural barrier to keep poor people out of those communities. And well, Margarita, what an example the of the pivot of the isthmus between social sustainability and environmental sustainability. Because, of course, we know that you know, mass public transport is a fantastic solve. And we see it in Nordic countries, you know, clean, fast, available to all, cheap, 
public transport is an absolute perfect solve for air pollution and for climate change. And there you've got a perfect example of where a barrier, a horrible, horrific barrier to social mobility is also a barrier to sustainability. And this is, this is what yes. we come across again and again and again. Uh, the solutions work the other way, though, as well. So take, for example, renewable energy. You know, we've got about 3 billion people on, the, on this planet right now who don't have access to continuous modern energy. And you don't, they, they can't turn the lights on for the electricity. It's actually unthinkable in 2021 that so many of our fellow human beings don't have access to that. Um, and you know we're not going to be able to reach those people with fossil fuels you know you are not going to be able to build a coal power station halfway up the himalayas to reach the communities there you're not going to be able to create a sort of nuclear power station sort of across particularly parts of sub-saharan africa where there's significant amounts of land mass between different communities so the the leapfrogging from things such as burning dung or burning kerosene or burning charcoal, which is a very unsustainable fuel from a climate change perspective, a dangerous fuel, particularly kerosene, and a really unpleasant one. I'm not sure if you've ever been into a home where people are burning kerosene or charcoal. The actual impact upon health of breathing in those particles, particularly for women who are the ones who are indoors doing the cooking is really serious. Leapfrog from that, dung and kerosene to solar panels you can get you know i've been in the himalayas and watched people carry so solar panels on their head up mountains you can get a solar panel wherever you can get a person <laughs> you can get a human being if you can get a donkey yeah. you can get a solar yeah. panel there so with things such as particularly renewable energy renewable energy is a solve to poverty and a solve to climate change i remember once saying you know the solutions to climate change solve everything else we have this massive serendipity, which is the way in which we solve this greatest threat to humankind's ongoing journey, is also the way in which we lift people out of poverty, provide equity and access. And so just like that barrier of that horrible man who put a barrier in the way of public transport in order to prevent social mobility, and then also he managed to block environmental progress, not even intending to yay 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 him he managed to, to <laughs> right. screw up society and environment at the same time i'm sure many people will be proud the, the the opposite is also true that the solutions the environmental solutions tend to also come with them with social solutions and the social solutions tend to be more environmentally friendly so if we could just get that in our head and not think about these things as being competing or even separate but actually you solve them in the same way and a solar panel is a perfect example of that then i think we're really onto something and it's where you start getting these sort of economies of scale and this zeitgeist solutions and these these extraordinary answers um uh that that weren't thought of before when people were thinking about these things in silos so how can we create the iphone sustainability <laughs> you know that 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 gateway technology that everybody wants and I remember when the iPhone came out in 2007, everyone was like, oh, it's, it was like a status thing. It was a cool thing. It was a prestige thing. It was pricey, yeah, but it didn't stop millions of people from buying it and wanting it. And then, of course, you know, creating that category of smartphone, and you see smartphones everywhere in the world. It's like people say, I, I need one of these. I have to have one of these for, you know, it goes from the status prestige down to, in order to operate in society, I have to have one, no matter how poor I am. Um, what can we, what's to be given, you know, we're looking at capitalist solutions, market-driven solutions. There aren't enough NGOs in the world to save the world and they don't get paid enough money. You know, when you look at the relative money in the capital markets versus philanthropy, it's like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using pennies to fight a problem that was cost with, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't have a chance, right? So what, where you sit, what is the, what do you see as the market opportunities? Because to your earlier point that 
there aren't enough careers in sustainability. How do we make it so people can make a good living saving yeah. the planet? Well, I think that there are an enormous number of people who already are. So there's a, a charity that I'm involved with um, called the Ashtons, and they are an innovation charity and they focus on sustainable energy around the world. And particularly, they look at small scale solar. So small scale solar. Small scale solar is the kind of thing which particularly those of us who already got lights that turn on think sounds like fun and like a nice addition and or a few solar panels. It is an absolute top desirable consumer product in many places in the world because if you've got that iphone you've got to be able to charge it and if you do not have an electrical grid in your village in your town um it, of, of often um uh in 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 the low quality housing that maybe you have access to then actually the only way you're going to to charge up that that smartphone is with a solar panel so small scale solar is absolutely from so many people around the world the most desirable consumer product the other of course really simply is a sustainable cook stove so one of the things which i'm really interested in is where solving women's problems solving the, the problems that women face around the world also solve poverty and solve climate change so we've gone from a binary of how do we solve poverty and how do we solve climate change at the same time to now a trifecta which is how do we solve issues for women and issues of sustainability and issues of climate change let's pile those solutions on top of each other yeah. so so a smart cook stove a cook stove that requires where you don't have to build up a great deal amount of charcoal or even a solar cook stove which doesn't have a solar panel in it it literally has got like silver paper around it um uh that that captures and focuses um the sun's heat what those cook stoves do is they don't let off a huge amount of air pollution that you and your children choke on they cook the f which means you, you know, you're healthier. They don't smell, which means your husband is prepared to come into the house whilst you're cooking. And they cook really quickly, which means actually a great deal more of your day is free and open up for you to work, teach your children. Do more chores. Do more chores gossip with your friends whatever it may be in fact when um uh, as part of the ashtons really had the luck to interview a lot of the women who are making and selling these and they said actually the number one reason why people like it is because it's improved their marriage because actually the husbands don't stay outside because they don't like the smell they will actually come inside and so something like a cook stove sometimes these are things are made out of the absolute ba basics a little bit of clay is often all it takes and you now have got like cook stove entrepreneurs across the world who are mass producing and selling these often, you know, village by village, town by town. And you, they're fascinating to watch. And again, it's something which sitting here in our, our incredible privilege, um, we're not aware of because I've got a microwave over there that I can flick on. But for that three billion human beings who don't necessarily have access to what we have access to, this is the most desirable um, product that you could have. And so we, it's, it's around, I think sometimes it's around redefining what we see as a desirable product. Is a desirable product in a big package which you pull off and it's the latest one that you haven't had for you know that nobody else has got you queued up to get from the store or what have you or is it a solar panel or a cook stove which is an incredibly desirable product for a lot of our fellow human beings around the world and again things that solve those trifactor issues things that solve four issues things that solve five issues five you know human beings are incredibly inventive and how do we find those fixes those those fixes because if something fixes a real life problem like your husband won't come indoors whilst you're cooking that's what's going to get people to buy not buy this cook stove because it'll save the world it's like buy this cook stove because it doesn't smell and it'll, it'll improve your marriage that's a marketing message <laughs>